colleges call directed learning activities. Um, and what you might think more readily as an idea of co-remedial education. So how many of you are familiar with the concept of co-remedial education? Do you guys have basic ed, zero credit? Dev ed? Are there zero credit courses at CUNY? Some schools, some institutions have gotten rid of them, but uh, you take the active place or you don't do well, and you have to go take a zero credit math class or act or my foundation lab or Alex for zero credit reading. Is there developmental ed in CUNY? Are there any people who do that? Is that the yeah. Yeah, um, you have to take them, and um, then if you do good in them, then you can go to the next level and of like college math. Yeah. yeah, you do that at your college. Yeah. So um, the idea here is that if you look at studies nationally of institutions, um, that strategy has not worked well. It's very expensive, right? If you're, you're telling a prospective student before you start in our four credit classes. We want you to take potentially a year of paid tuition courses or zero credit to be ready for the four credit courses. Uh, and the effectiveness in the subsequent courses is almost zero. So this idea of directed learning activities rose out of the California Community Colleges to bake that core remediation into the four credit courses to create small units of learning whether it's semi, the difference between a semicolon and a colon, whether it's how to solve a uh, system of equations, uh, whether it's calculating the area of a circle, right, it might be construction estimation class, um, uh, might be a you know, CNC machining class, might be a nursing class where they've got to know a certain amount of math for biology, uh, and you inject this learning into the class, and, and sort of the, the benefit here is, um, and this on this screen on whiteboard you can't quite see, but one of the challenges with basic ed is um, about 30% of the students that schools put in that remedial ed plan um, could have passed for credit if they had started it. And what happens is student services and the administration set the basic cutoff higher than they might want to. Why? Well, they already have a low pass rate in those gateway courses like chemistry and intro to economics. And the students, they feel like they need that work. Well, if you can get them for remediation, about 30% of them will pass just fine. Um, but there's another thing that happens, and that is the student is presented by advising when they take their active placer with the fact that they're going to take this year of zero credit and they don't even start. There's a lot of evidence that says if you don't make this core remediation in, these students don't even start at your college. So you start with a narrower funnel of people coming in. And what we want to think about is a different way to think through curriculum. So how many of you know what a curriculum map is? Do curriculum mapping with your program, right? So the idea is here's a traditional curriculum map, right? Your course and your course objective and say a program learning outcome or workforce skill or nursing standard, right, just sort of your traditional map. What we do is we let you add an additional dimension. Uh, and that is some basic skill required to succeed in that learning objective or that learning outcome. So say this is, we'll go back to that example of the construction estimation course, right, here's a, uh, you know, risk assessment learning outcome and you need to know that physics of simple machines knows this thing rickety and going to fall over. It's got, uh, say, a final report. You need to know, you know, sentence structures in the five-paragraph format for an essay. Um, this is a cost estimation. Is it a reasonable cost estimate? You need to know some exponents. And so the idea here is um, a student may or may not be ready with all of the specific basic skills to succeed in a course, that's okay for you because if you're doing some simple early formative assessments and you get that data back, you can surface these directed learning activities uh, and the students now have a much better chance of succeeding without having gone into the basic ed. Does that make sense? Uh, more, oops, I didn't want to click whatever I just clicked there. Um, Something is not happy here. Just give me a second. Um, yep, 
You guys did not come to watch a little yellow ball spin, did you? No, I, it's not. It's, it's uh, something is not right here. That's what I get for using fancy fonts. Um, No, it, it is just not my day. Hmm. I do not know why that is doing that. Let me just do this. Nope. All right, well, I'm going to have to just tell you the rest of this story because um, this is not coming back. I do not know. All right, well, oh, there. All right. Okay. Ignore. We will start again. This is still live casting. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> All right. We'll pick that up where we go. Okay. Um, so the full version of the story uh, is that... Um, You've now got a link between your gen ed outcome with your course objective, your course learning outcome, but also this basic skills. And so now you can set up co remediation, gen ed reinforcement, might be a supplemental thing like a social media badge assessment. And as the student is going through the course, the Illumin assessment engine is aware of these things availability and as a, as a student is assessed and you find out how they're doing, they can automatically be assigned. More importantly, they can be linked and rostered in student services contexts. So if you have a bibliography workshop that also does assessment in the library or you have a math lab or STEM tutoring, you can automatically roster these students in those settings so that they know to be there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday between 3 and 5 and that tutor can check off and say, yep, they came here they finished that assessment and now you can track did they do better. So one of the benefits of that, quite apart from deeply improving student learning, is as you're looking at things like your program accreditation or your uh, funding for student services or even your, your institutional accreditation, you can answer questions like, how are various subpopulations doing in our learning? Did we deliver student services to help that learning and was it effective? Right, so some of the questions you can answer for accreditation become substantially more sophisticated, but more importantly, the system is generating that data for you so you don't have to spend months in the IR office trying to figure out if that's the case. And then for the student, what happens is they get to go on what we call an outcomes journey, right? So they start off and their skills graph up there to the upper left, uh, isn't necessarily that fleshed out, right? There's a lot of half and, 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 and not well-developed knowledge. As they move forward through the curriculum, you can start to track. There are certain skills that they continue to not develop, and now they're going to, you know, I was just talking to some people from Civitas the other day, and what they're finding is there's not necessarily a predictive uh, relationship between course A and course B. They sometimes don't find out that the students at risk tell that course B. Right? They accumulated a gap in knowledge such that when they got to this course, they really got nailed. And so the idea is if you're doing outcomes assessment in that course in better way and sort of building up this implicit student graph that can be compared against the expectations of the curriculum, you can be filling in those gaps along the way before they become too much. Uh, and then the final benefit is so you're retaining those students. The final benefit is uh, those students leave knowing they are skills ready for the workforce. 
folks. They know that they know what they were expected to know as a result of your curriculum, right? So giving the student that confidence that here's what we expected you to know. Do you actually know it? And um, all the while, you've been generating great data for your TAC grant, for your program accreditation, for institutional accreditation. That's sort of been taking care of itself uh, while you get the benefit of uh, building that skills graph for the students and being able to do something about any gaps you identify. So what does this look like? Um, well, one of the things we do is we actually have a student self-assessment. So when you create an assessment rubric in a course for a student, uh, any lumen, you can choose to make, give students the option to self-assess against it. So they're building that metacognitive skill, do I know, as I'm turning in this assignment, what I think I was supposed to learn on the assignment? And we're telling you certain things like, you know what, I really just didn't understand that aspect of the assignment, here's the work. And now they can develop, have a conversation between the faculty member and the student at the criteria and the overall rubric level. Here's how you think you did. Here's how you actually did. Let's have a discussion about that. Uh, and if they need that extra work, here you'll see there's that directed learning activity popped into the course. So they can really further uh, that learning discussion. And, and by the way, uh, it didn't take any work for the faculty member to set this up. As long as the department set up that link as your student success or the advisory context set up that link in the system, that automatically appears. So a few other things that we made possible, or I went to a couple of uh, portfolio uh, workshops earlier today, is integrating this course embedded assessment and the fact that you succeeded on those directed learning activities, they might be supplemental learning activities in the more positive sense, social media management, extra credit in a marketing class, uh, where the student is now building up a view of themselves over time. Here you can see some of these have assessments built in where they see the kind of person they're becoming, right? So uh, as you move be into the course embedded assessment model to get better data for accreditation, if you surface that back out to the student, they can start to build a better picture of themselves and kind of a richer conversation with the institution, with their mentors, with workforce, uh, here's who I have become. Uh, you can start to develop gamification in the form of badges that you have to earn, not just get in a single course. So you can set up these sort of attainment rules based on those course embedded assessments. Uh, it might just be a series of signature assessments in the program pathway, um, right? So say there's 20 courses in a program, there's eight assignments within those 20 courses where the student is assessed on multi-rater or very sophisticated capstone project in that course that captures their progress on their pathway. And then finally, um, the ability to produce in, in programs where you set this up, uh, an extended transcript of skills as well as grades where that person says, yep, here's all the nursing competencies I've mastered, uh, here's what ones I haven't quite mastered, and here's the date and the evaluator on, of my mastery. Drill into the work that led to their mastery. Uh, and we're actually seeing certain program creditors demand this now. They know that this is a thing that is possible. And so the um, AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association, I believe pharmacy and several others now require that you're able to produce this for every student in the program. So those students know I'm going out as a pharmacy tech with these accredited skills. And then finally, you know, we think that there's kind of a new story emerging, generally speaking, for uh, designing of intentional student success. Uh, and the story goes something like, every student comes to you, or many of you, some don't know what they want, I didn't want, know what I wanted when I started college, but uh, once they did figure it out, I, want, I said, I want to be a, and in this case, it's a clean energy technician. Uh, and we know that there are certain skills required to become a clean energy tech. Right? If you can't do these things, you're not going to succeed in the workforce as a clean energy tech. So let's backwards design the curriculum around those intended skills. As we're doing that, let's align the course content that we deliver, could just be in our syllabus, could be in the LMS, against those outcomes or those workforce skills. Let's, these are those DLAs, right, align the supporting student services that help you 
through the hump of those skills in those gateway courses, uh, suddenly now you've got that program pathway. Well, the badges you can earn in the course of it become kind of a directed graph of badges. And now Tommy or Susan or Raphael get the view here of I'm 15% through my program at the introductory level, I've mastered 82% of the outcomes, I haven't mastered them at the mastery level, uh, and I've earned these four badges so far. Um, they have now an investment, personally, in becoming this person and knowing both what they're going to know when they're done, but how you can serve them both in the classroom and in your student services and or just ad hoc through an additional module and blackboard um, in attaining the kind of thing that they want it to be. Um, so, as we're asked, because we're a guided pathway school, for instance, or because our accreditor, our nursing accreditor, our uh, pharmacy accreditor are asking us for this data, uh, what we're seeing schools do is say, you know what, that's great data, and ultimately the accreditor is looking for things like, uh, you know, what are you teaching, is it effective, are there any things you're doing to improve the student learning? The best way to answer that question is for the students, right? Not to have sort of just the narrative as an institution, but working instances of improved learning and improved success at the student level. Um, so that's the talk. Um, any questions about the model and any thinking about um, the work that goes into it or the value for an improved assessment reading? It may be a stupid question. Yeah. If somebody, if, if a, a college, a community college does this, are they aware of where they where their students should be? In other words, like do they get data on schools in East LA and and in the canyon and so forth? You know those kinds of benchmarks? Sure. So if they're we our our schools typically will rely for the comparative data on a partner like EAB, right? Um, we don't currently support benchmarking against other schools just because the schools don't want to release their data necessarily. Well, that's what I was get it. Um, but I think uh, the bigger story is inside the school, what schools are finding is that this is very effective. So, for instance, up in the canyons, called the canyons in Santa Clarita, uh, they're on our platform and starting this fall, they're actually the one who I was thinking of, uh, where every program is going to have six to eight signature assessments, so they don't have to assess like crazy in every course, but throughout sort of the program pathway, they've picked the courses where they know here's a point where I've got to know that the student knows how to do the following skills, and they've built these sort of rich capstone assessments in those courses where they can get a cut at here's how the students are doing, not only how the program is doing, but also how the students are doing. And I think as that data set builds up, it'll be better to, uh, right, and I think not very many schools have that level of per student data where they can be comparing. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, well thank you very much and let's go to lunch.